Okay, good afternoon. It's time to start our one of the last pre-last session. Uh, an attempt to climb up or fly up and see the memory field uh, from above again. Uh, uh, and to reduce the, the diversity and, and house of collected memories that we are talking about in the morning mostly, I think, in our small sessions. Uh, again to the level of collective memory to some uh, something somehow simple um, and giving more orientation um, on the abstract level also we'll have uh, three papers but four speakers uh, in this panel it will last two hours uh, it will be concluded by uh, by um, um, remarks or comments from professor michael bernhard with whom you know already from the previous days and from a keynote, and then discussion as usual. So no, the first paper, uh, first presenter is Burkhard Olszowski. He's not only presenter here, but also one of the organizers, conveners of the conference, uh, worked and still works for uh, the network, European Network Remembers and Solidarity, organizer of this event. Uh, many years in Warsaw, now in, uh, in Germany. Where exactly? In Oldenburg, yeah, um, and he worked for, uh, on on Polish uh, German uh, uh, memory and history of the of the uh, recent years, and contributed also in the last uh, years in the, to the project on the yeah, memoir, the big project, in the Polish Academy of Science uh, Historical Center in Berlin, uh, and he. Uh, he, gradu he made his PhD on Humboldt University um, uh, and studied before in, uh, in Göttingen, Warsaw and Berlin. Okay, that's enough maybe for the introduction. Floor is yours. Thank you, Piotr, for the introduction. In my paper, I would like to explore the significance of 1989 upheaval for both countries, Poland and Germany. What forms of interpretation and conflicts did this crucial point evoke and who were the primary participants and interpretators? I will concentrate particularly particular on the two anniversaries of 2009 and 2014, with their numerous activities, publications, and products. In conclusion, then some remarks about the relevance or the transnational relevance of 1989. The memory of 1989 is a subject to an almost daily reconstruction, restructuring in view of the abrupt changes that occurred to the established political order and to the course of people's life as a, as a result to, of this date. Constant remembrance activity on the part of participants together with a wide diversity of interpretations also means that there is an inherently temporary and fluid nature to any description of that place and time 1989. There's a broad consensus among political parties in Poland that without the impact of a trade union, Solidarność and the Central and Eastern European revolutions would not have taken place. This view is often linked with attempts to make other Europeans aware of Polish destiny and Polish achievements. Given this seeming political accord, it would be appear even more paradoxically that the memory of the year 1989 and the round table, the central Polish export hit, so I would say, as a symbol of peace, is more controversial within Poland and in the public eye than, in any, other, than any other historical event in recent Polish history. As far as Polish culture over the last 25 years is concerned, with its political lines in the sand and the intellectual atmosphere within current 
day, the year 1989 remains an important and defining date. It represents, obviously, the attainment of freedom, democracy, and free speech and opinion. At the same time, it becomes a critical, if also a controversial, point of reference for the subsequent political, economic, and legal transformation in Poland. The inherent tension behind the remembrance of 1989 originates less than the diversity of personal memories. The comparable short space of time since 1989 can be counted as one of the main reasons behind these events. But instead of appearing to be a part um, of a history, it's rather a part of an apparently everlasting present day with clear differences between the people who are involved. Historical consideration tend not only to be bound to the present day and specific locations, but also orientated towards the future, influenced by current and short-term trends, interests, and maneuverings. The treatment of 1989 in Poland is a striking example for this reality. The predominant narrative in the 1990s, considering the discussion about the roundtable talks, uh, was epitomized in the, the Polish Revolution, which was achieved not on the barricades, like the Warsaw Uprising, but around a peaceful negotiation table. The round table represents tolerance, openness, and the ability to overcome political rifts. And each of these qualities was deemed to be exemplary for a new political culture. In addition, for some of the proponents of the round table, was declared for, as a symbol of an end of a national civil war by renouncing their power without bloodshed. The communists had somehow compensated um, for their sins of the martial law at the beginning of the, of the 1980s. The round table was orientated towards the future and an evolutionary transition. Accordingly, its specifications were different to questions regarding political guilt and the wrongs of the past. Critics of the roundtable discussions call up the memory of the spirit of optimism felt at the founding of Solidarność. The spirit of Solidarność should have give a new and different meaning to the most recent history and the starting point of Polish democracy. Characteristically, these voices decried that the outbreak of the strike in August 1980, but not the round table, should assume the central role in, yeah, in, in Polish debates and Polish history. Gradually, a sense of competition started to arise between the various places in time, to which truly was at the core the different perception of 1989 and the subsequent events. While some claimed that the round table was a culmination of the Solidarność movement, others countered that the pact with the communists would ultimately impeded or prevent a transformation of public life and rebuilding the new Polish state after 1989. Among those circles willing to give, um, probably you might know the, the, the faces of these people, uh, beginning from the right, it's Wawansa, Jaruzelski, Kishak, and Adam Michnik. And um, among those circles, willing to give voices 
to their discontent regarding the state of things in Poland and the Third Republic, which was founded in 1989. The round table mutated in a symbol um, of, a, of a bad transformation. The round table had made it very difficult to achieve any sense of moral reckoning with communism. But above all, through this process, the old nomenclatura had been given a disproportionate ability uh, to participate, and in particular in the privatization process, um, where they could again enrich themselves. The round table, um, as such, was actually seen as a real evil or a problem at a source in the critical memory of 1989. It was the spirit of the round table that had led to indiscriminate assumption of West European liberal models and neoliberal economic, <coughs> economic concepts. Whereas the, ninth, the anniversary in 1999 recognized the round table as an overwhelming symbol of the upheaval, in 2009, both the current political circumstances and the general public mean that a far more emphasis should be, should be paid than on the election, on the partial free election of June 4th, 1989. This became in 2009 a more pivotal um, event than in a memory. That is in a nice example. Um, on the top is written, um, you, or on, on the down is written, you, you should vote on June 4th, uh, otherwise, in, in, in order that we will proud of you. I mean, these sleeping chills. <laughs> mm. The date, the 4th of June, uh, accentuated the political activization uh, for ordinary citizens and an agreement on a significance uh, that these elections should be happened. Nevertheless, nevertheless the new agreement on uh, June 4th was belittled by the embarrassment dispute between Poland's political parties in 2009 regarding the government and the opposition. Um, by emphasizing this key date, it was hoped that the West European general public, but also then the West European uh, political leaders, would finally appreciate the historical Polish fight for freedom. But many hopes were in vain because of the animosi animosities, uh, animosi um, animosities between Polish parties, in particular between the, the Polish president at that time, Lech Kaczynski, and the government party under uh, Donald Tusk. The question as to which view of the round table would ultimately prevail in Polish society continues until today quite unclear or balanced, you might say. Uh, according to the Public Opinion Research Center, 42% of Polish citizens consider the res <coughs> resolution of the round table to be more or less positive. 10% reject them out of hand and 48% are not interested uh, or, hold no or, or, no <coughs> or hold no firm opinion either way. Reception of the Polish Roundtable, however, was positive 
in Germany as well as in the Federal Republic uh, of Germany as in the GDR, so in the almost reformed GDR in, in end 1989 and 1990. The roundtable was an original Polish concept uh, aroused a great deal of interest, uh, particular among opposition groups in the GDR. And the table was perceived, or the results were perceived as an example, worth following and putting into practice. In contrast to the Polish counterpart, the round table in the GDR, which happened, um, some of you might don't know this, uh, there um, happened then from um, December 1989 until March 1990. And the round table in the GDR was rather neglected and it was rather slipped away into obscurity. Any memory of those discussions, predominantly by East German, uh, were not much paid attention, in particular in the press. In Germany, the commemoration of 1989 lacks the political potency that is so characteristic for the Polish confrontation uh, with memories of 1989. In contrast to Poland, events didn't focus on a compromise between political adversaries. Um, it was far more the collapse than of the SED regime themselves uh, that caused then, the, the following events and um, and laid finally then, to to the end of the GDR and the German reunification. A further unique characteristic for memories of 1989 in Germany can essentially be attributed to the different degree in which events affected in East and in the West. The East German experience and expectations during this change of regi regime changed swiftly from those moments of happiness, having demanded and achieved freedom, to a feeling of being overwhelmed by the rapid change and the Western life in 1990. For the major majority of West Germans, the fall of the wall remained basically a mass media event that in reality hardly affected their everyday existence. Some two decades later, this pronounced contradiction between the perception of those in East and West still exists in individual narratives and memories. In addition, and, and in contrast to Poland and other Central European countries, the German autumn of 1989 didn't only mark the beginning of a political upheaval, but it's also then connected then with the fall of the wall in November 9th of 1989. And the question of nationhood was back on the table. A main difference between experience and understanding arose among the various citizens. Why East Germany, East Germans had a double-edged experience of both of regimes. On the one hand, it's the free parliamentary election in March 18 of 1919 and the national unification finally accomplished in October 3rd, 1990. The West Germans have only the reunification. For the majority of East Germans, 1989 also had an Eastern Central European dimension. Um, it is a natural characteristic of revolutions that they undermined the legit <coughs> legitimacy um, of the ruling power. And 
One example is saying the often quoted and a bit simplified sentence. Uh, it took 10 years in Poland, 10 months in Hungary, 10 weeks in East Germany, and 10 days in Czechoslovakia. The mass media played their part in the acceleration and <coughs> acceleration of these developments. In addition to the symbolism of 1989, uh, central controversy regarding the significance of this place, uh, well, is the is then the the memory of 1989 between both uh, meanings, freedom and unity. On the one hand, there is a narrative sees the events of 1989 um, fostering freedom and democracy. From this perspective, 1989 represents the awakening of GDR population as a democratic, dem democratic uh, sovereign power and the people's movement. On the other side, there is uh, the symbolism of the fall of the Berlin War as an icon of German reunification. In addition to this function as a medium um, and as a projection screen for inner German relations, held in a metaphoric wall of the division of Germany, Europe and the world along before 1989. In Germany, the 9th of November uh, has a fixed place filled with emotional feelings and happiness in a collective memory of Germans. Germany's un un <coughs> unity was conceivable with the November 9th and soon after truly possible. However, this unification narrative characteristically mainly from the West German perspective For East German citizens, uh, the predominantly um, narrative keeps on the keeps the the, the issue as an of freedom, and in the second in the second part, um, the issue of unity. In spite of the persistent criticism regarding uh, the devaluation of revolution for freedom, the memory gap about the events uh, increasingly become a topic of public discussion in Germany. Um, I'll give you one example. Leipzig, the, the place where the biggest people's protest against the SEG regime happen, was gradually developing into an alternative location to Berlin for remembrance. While the German capital city monopolized the symbol of the fall of the wall. Leipzig presented itself as a realm of memory politics, as the keeper of the tradition regarding the struggle for freedom, which had remained in the shadow of a German unity since 1990. Coming to the anniversaries uh, in 2009 and 2014, there were numerous commemoration events and one was in particular striking. In 2009, um, on the Brand Brigade gathered um, the leaders from the Allied forces, Great Britain, France, Russia, and the USA. But no, um, among the speakers, there were no 
representative from the Central European countries. Also, then the uh, former East German dissidents were rather than put apart or marginalized. Mm. In recent days, uh, the Bundespräsident Joachim Gauck, part of the media, including the ruling CDU party, has been much concerned about the likely election of the first state prime minister in Thuringia, Bodo Ramelow. He is a representative of Die Linke, which is a left party and a successor party of the SED. They were omnipresent and, and governing until 1989. Um, this event or this um, this coalition, uh, which is likely going to be to be happen, is a coalition between Social Democrats and Greens with uh, the left party. There were and are protests, uh, not to mention an appeal by Thuringian Social Democrats who had taken part in the demonstration in 1989. The appeal had the title, Don't Betray the Goals of 1989 and Preserve the Reputation of Our Parties. Though the debate in German newspapers is still going on and it was heated up also because of the 25-5 anniversary of uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The general response in particular to this appeal was very limited and uh, as well as in Thuringia and, and the rest of Germany. In this year, commemorations and, and many private memories uh, attracting attention. They are published in newspapers, in the internet, and it's particularly striking that a lot of space uh, is devoted to the so-called Wendekinder. Uh, it means children who were born uh, around 1989, mostly before 1989. Adriana Letrari, um, she's a representative of the so-called Wendekinder, and she's a co-founder of a network which is called Third Generation East. And she has a quite critical approach to, as to the commemoration of, um, of the fall of the war. She is speaking for routinized uh, style of uh, memory culture. And she's pleading that these old stories are not once again reproduced with uh, newly uh, coffee table books. Instead, sh instead, she seeks a broadening of the focus as a distance from the, these events. And she simply asked what actually remains of the revolution 1989. This que question, of course, it's, it's not easy to answer. And, uh, and she is promoting um, a self-critical approach to the accomplishment of, of German unity, and she is uh, yeah, promoting a uh, forward-looking narrative of the unified Germany in the future. Now, yeah, some finally remarks to Poland and Germany and some uh, comparison. As a consequence uh, of the disagreement outlined at the beginning um, of the commemoration of 1989 among the Polish political class, the initiative Together 89, Razem 89, was established in 2010. It was a civic initiative create the aim of common celebrating the events of 1989. The organizers uh, hope to keep alive 
the memory of the struggle for freedom and at the same time stimulating the feeling of solidarity as well as concern for a common future. These attitudes were ex expressed, among other things, uh, through the broad and mutual uh, um, appreciation for the life of Tadeusz Mazowiecki, uh, who died then last year. Mazowiecki was a man of strong Christian and moral convictions, and at the same time, a man of moderation, looking inwardly and reconciliation looking outwards. These are characteristics that are indeed rare in the world of politics, leading consequently to the motto, we love Tadeusz Mazowiecki. Both logos, uh, which you've seen behind me, uh, yes, yeah, symbolically seeking to promote a sense of public spirit and encourage identification uh, with historical pictures and the upheaval of 1989. Now, well, I have to, to ask, did the memory uh, contribu contribute to the reconciliation between the adversaries in Poland? Unfortunately, it has not yet been started, or it has he started barely. There are new critical priorities, um, for example, emphasizing the social political deficits of the fast economic transformation, which is called often the shock therapy. Uh, these are uh, quite new, though the, the thick line, which was much emphasized some five years ago, uh, doesn't play in a particular role in this year. Now coming to the end. Um, the year 1989, and now I'm referring to one project of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. Uh, I do apologize for this kind of self-advertisement, but, uh, well, I have to do this somehow. Uh, the year 19, 1989 was a turning point for you for Europe, obviously, with global consequences, including the end of the Cold War. The question was to whether it is good as a founding myth for the newly formed Europe. In 1989, obviously helped to achieve a successful foundation of a democratic constitutional state and more than in just one country. The year 1989 made Europe, as we know it today, just possible. It would be wrong to confuse the history of memory and the significance with history itself. And for that reason, we will need to wait and see whether 1989 does become a mutual distinctive reference point for the memory culture in Poland, Germany, but also in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And let's move quickly to the next presentation, which will be a double one, uh, and which will be done by uh, Anna Leidinger, which Change her name into no. Basis. <laughs> okay. And La Lars Breuer, they both uh, are research associates at the Free University of Berlin and work together in the project um, uh, on collective memory as a basis for identification with Europe, which is based on uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, research. So, methodology is important here. And we will uh, hear the um, part of the findings of this project now. And Lars has recently defended his PhD by Harald Welzer uh, on ver German and Polish vernacular memory of the Second World War. The book is in publishing now. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm Anna Delius and this is my and uh, 
uh, we're going to present you some really preliminary findings as our project is not finished yet and um, we are still uh, working in progress. Um, and after the talk of Burkhard Olszewski, you might uh, find some parallels maybe. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion in the end. Um, and as we have not so much time, uh, I would like to start immediately with our presentation. Um, in 2009, agencies of the Polish government put up huge posters at several places in central Berlin saying Solidarność, it started at noon, citing Tomasz Sarnecki's famous poster from 1989. This can be interpreted as an attempt to pursue transnational memory politics. Obviously, the posters were meant to tell citizens and visitors, sorry, Obviously, the posters were meant to tell citizens and visitors of Berlin about the impact of the Polish opposition movement and stress the role of Poland as a starting point of democratic transformation in other Central European countries in 1989. Today, our question is, did this work? Is there a transnational European perception of the processes of 1989? We try to answer this question by asking ordinary Europeans about their memories. We will present some preliminary findings from a research project still in progress titled Collective Memory as a Basis for Identification with Europe. In the, two, in the project, the two of us with our Professor Jürgen Gerhards examine the relationship between national and transnational frameworks and interpretations of the past. Empirically, we focus on four European countries, Germany, Poland, Spain, and the UK. In these four countries, we are examining two levels of memory. First, we reconstruct the official memory on the basis of secondary literature supplemented by political speeches. Second, we take a look at ordinary people's views of the past or the level of vernacular memory, as you might call it, on the basis of our focus groups. This is what our presentation will focus upon. In each country, we interviewed four groups defined by A, the level of education, and B, the international experience. Altogether, we conducted 16 focus groups with 109 participants. Each group consisted of six to eight participants between 10, 25, and 40 years of age. Quota sampling was used according to gender and political affiliation. I promised now it's going to stop with all these numbers. Um, the group discussion started with an open question about any historic figures or events the participants still consider important today, but also addressed particular topics like the Holocaust. The structure of this presentation is the following. After a brief look at the UK and Spain, I will be showing you the frameworks of Polish citizens' memories of 1989, and after this I will pass the mic to Lars, uh, who is going to tell you about the German memories of 1989. In Spain and the UK, the changes of 1989 hardly play any role at all. In Spain, the fall of the wall and the reunification of Germany is virtually absent, just as the fall of communism in other countries is. Only when prompted about the solidarity movement in Poland, participants would vaguely refer to Lech Wałęsa as this trade union leader in Gdansk who was making trouble. In the UK, we could observe some brief flashbulb memories referring to the fall of the Berlin Wall, basically being interpreted as a victory of democracy. So frankly, there's not much to tell you about um, ordinary people's views in Spain and the UK. The only conclusion we can draw from this little is that empirically, there's not even a sign of a shared European memory of 1989. National pa memory patterns prevail, also in the other two countries, as we will see. There is no focus on the two countries in our sample which have been deeply changed in the years from 1989, Poland and Germany. In all the four groups, the end of communism isn't as important to the participants as other topics, for example, World War II or related issues. However, when being asked which events or people they consider most important in history, participants mentioned the Solidarity Movement, Lech Wałęsa, and Pope John Paul II. Also in general, the processes of the 1980s seem to be more salient in the year than the year 1989 as such. Communism is a historical reference for comparisons with the current social situation in Poland. 
Only when talking about the political system and the non-democratic character of the communist regime, the participants refer to it as history. We have identified three framings of 1989 in our Polish focus groups. Those are the end of communism as a change for everyday life, the end of communism as a common national achievement, and the end of communism within a transnational setting. I would like to start with a quote. Well, maybe the welfare was bigger, didn't it? In the sense of offering everyone something, may it be a little, because it was a little. But at least you had something, didn't you? It was secured from above, work for example. In Poland, a frame used often to talk about communism and 1989 is private and everyday life. But due to the lack of time, I won't dive into it too deeply. In one of our groups, participants show a diffuse feeling of nostalgia that is grounded in the social security provided by the communist regime and is perceived as opposite to the current social situation in Poland. Our results, people feeling sorry for the decrease of social welfare and generally less secure, are backed up by the latest survey conducted by the Public Opinion Research Center CEBOS, stating that only 45% of the population thinks that the changes of 1989 were worth it. It goes without saying that this interpretation contradicts the official view in 1989 as a change to the better, that likes to look at the social movements of the 1980s and the drastic economic changes of the 1990s as two totally different processes that are not linked to each other. Only few participants explicitly mention democratic achievements of 1989 in the context of everyday life or talk about 1989 in terms of freedom and civil rights. For our participants, the transformation to capitalism and the changes in welfare in Poland after 1989 seem to be the dominant vectors in the evaluation of the transformation. Democracy is being appreciated, interpreted in terms of civil rights and human dignity, but seems to be less important when talking about economic changes. The second frame is a national one. In our focus group discussions, communism is never part of the lives of the Poles, but always a counterpart, almost an antagonist to Polishness. This is why the end of communism is often being identified with the liberation of Poland. As we can see here, the participant... Oh, sorry, I, I cut out of this quote because of time. Um, um, and regarding the exclusion of the, people, the Polish People's Republic history from the national tradition, the interpretation of the liberation of 1989 as a liberation of Poland matches Poland's official memory politics. Following this narrative, the year 1989 becomes an ending point of centuries of struggle for sovereignty and freedom. I quote, because there was the war, the world war, after that we've never been free. It's well known. It was hard for us to get rid of the system, I mean Soviet Union. And this was exactly the most important thing about it, that we got rid of it without bloodshed and kept being free. The peaceful character of the transformation is regarded as something unusual in Polish history. The feeling that 1989 was a particular historical exception became obvious when a woman refers to it as a fairy tale. In our interviews, communist actors remain unnamed. Consequently, the solidarity movement is being interpreted as a revolution of the whole people, not the one of a particular group of actors. But whom those people fought against is not being explicated. In Poland, unlike Germany, it's very common to refer to Poland, Polish history and Polish sports or politics by using words like us, we or our. It is not unusual, therefore, that the respondents talk about the revolution as their revolution, but it also proves a very high identification with the national collective. These results show the selectivity of memory. Whereas the processes of democratization and the peaceful revolution are clearly interpreted as aspects of national history, the communist system as such remains in an opposite position and is excluded from the national narrative. Moreover, communism is being presented as an ideology without people. This might be a symptom of the strong intertwining of the concepts of people and nation in Polish history of ideas rooting in the long period of no Polish statehood. A third dominant pattern reveals an inferiority complex and is linked to the division of Europe after 1945. Polish participants consider their own national history to be ignored by others and more precisely being covered by the iconic fall of the Berlin Wall. 
whereas they interpret the solidarity movement as a pioneer movement for democratization in Central and Eastern Europe and believe that it inspired other, other processes transnationally, they feel a stark imbalance between the international attention directed towards the fall of the Berlin Wall in relation to the knowledge and appreciation that Polish activists of the solidarity movement receive. Quote, well, yes, but Europe thinks that the fall of communism started in Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the majority of Europeans is, well, that Poland, it's well known that here at our place one fought for the cause and with Poland. And I'm saying, all over Europe they say that this was the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall, end of quote. What is particularly interesting here is the image that the Polish participants draw of the perception of Polish history feeling ignored and neglected. Several respondents stressed that the solidarity movement was the first of its kind. The fear that others might rewrite Polish history, mostly in terms of perpetratorship and victimhood, is one latent light motif of our discussions and often appeared in the context of World War II in terms of perpetratorship and victimhood. Here it is adapted to the case of the end of communism. As a second transnational aspect, our participants draw a mental map like construction of a position between the concept of Europeanism uh, and communism, describing 1989 as an opening towards Europe and an outstepping from backwardness. Whereas communism means a step backwards, Europe is, is perceived as modern. Within this interpretation, the solidarity movement serves as a proof of Europeanness of Poland and its people. Quote, moderator. So, what is it that you want to tell us that we are not what kind of country? Marta? A communist one. That, I don't know, that we aren't close to Russia, we don't belong to Russia, that we are a country that just joined the European Union, that we try to develop, that we have a known voice. Well, and also the Pope. End of quote. By constructing an opposition between Europe and communism, the fight against communism becomes a fight for Europe. The efforts done by the population itself seem to be a proof that Poles are not Eastern, communist, etc., in the eyes of the participants. European in this concept means being not communist, not being oppressed, facing a strong civil society and, after all, being not Eastern but Western. Polish respondents drew a set of cleavage lines connecting national ideas with universal attributes. Europe versus Russia and the East, Poland versus communism, freedom versus dictatorship, modernity versus backwardness, and a strong civil society versus an oppressed people. Simultaneously, communist times are connected to backwardness. As we have seen before, they are also associated with social welfare, but this aspect disappears whenever the European context is mentioned. Clearly, the respondents' perspective is directed towards Europe. It is their point of reference that they compare themselves and their nation to. It can be concluded that Polish respondents not only confront communism in their national history, but they seem to exclude communism from European history by embedding the history of democratization into the narrative of a return to Europe, as if it had not been a part of Europe before 1989. From this point of view, Poland starting, starting being European when protesting against the communist regime and moved westwards on the mental maps of our participants. Let's now go to Germany. Now, yeah, okay. So for the German participants, um, we can say that it is the only of the four countries where it, the changes of 89 and 90 are one of the most extensively discussed topics. And the memory again stays within a national framework and more specifically we have two main aspects people talk about. First, it's the fall of the Berlin Wall and second, the process of integration of East and West German societies after 1990. So as for the first uh, topic, um, let's look at how th this is being addressed by the participants. The event is uh, mainly perceived in national terms, so as an end of, uh, of the Gem division of Germany or an end of the so-called German question, but it's not coined in, in transnational terms as an end of communism, neither on a European or on a global scale. Um, and we have three um, main points of references. In the, uh, in the memories of the fall of the wall. Um, the first are flashbulb memories, so that's mainly references to prominent TV images from 
89 or 90. And um, some to, just to give you two examples, uh, one would be uh, GDRO East Berlin citizens being welcomed in West Berlin just after the fall of the wall. And another one would be people uh, celebrating at the Brandenburg Gate. So this is like the um, images that have kind of become uh, part of the iconic heritage and that, uh, that are used as a frequent point of reference. Um, and those public images are often intertwined with family stories or personal anecdotes. So the images are basically um, used as a template for stories, how participants perceive the historic event or, um, or for telling what they did on that very day. And this is the very essence of flashbulb memories. So uh, to give you one quote, I'm sorry I didn't put it on, on the presentation. Everybody has their personal memories of it. I will never forget that day either. I went to school that day. My parents have always been very dutiful and told me, it's Saturday, of course you're going to school. And I was sitting there with just two other students. All the others went to the West with their parents to have a look. So this is putting themselves into that image which everyone knows. Um, but the scope of those stories rarely tr transcend the, the family sphere. So there's hardly any political or, or historic framing, framing of those uh, anecdotes. Um, but I think there's two purposes of this linking between uh, the, the family stories and the public imaginary Im imagery. Um, first, it's uh, linking the own life word to the big history, so to say. So it's, it's saying, I've been there, uh, I've been part of it. And second, um, as I said, they provide kind of a common framework which people can relate to. But as a consequence of that, uh, they hardly ever express any, any elaborated interpretation of those events by themselves, which is a pity for us because that was actually what we were interested in in our research. Uh, and then the third point of reference is uh, local or spatial memories. As the German focus groups have been conducted in Berlin, the city plays a key role um, for, for many of the participants. And they would refer to remnants of the wall, gap sites, or other you know, spatial traces um, of the division of the city. Uh, and here I have another quote. I think it's still present. I think that you're surrounded by it everywhere here. It's still a current topic. So it's kind of not just history, but um, visible still on an everyday basis. Um, and according to those references, one could say that the framework is not even national, but rather regional or local one. Um, the second topic discussed by the participants is the integration of East and West German societies, all the problems related to it. And here again, we have three aspects. Um, the first one is that, according to many participants, the relationship between East and West Germans is still determined by mutual prejudices. And here I have a quote from a West German participant. She said, I've experienced it myself. I moved to the East without any bias. I thought it's all neat and nice. And then especially the older ones were going like, oh, you're from the West, go away. You can really feel it. So many respondents uh, actually in this, I think, express their kind of disappointment about the fact that uh, even more than 20 years after the fall of the wall, national unity is not, has still not become a social reality. Um, and, in their, and there's still this, this uh, prominent uh, proverb of the, the Mauer in den Köpfen, the wall in people's minds, that, still, that was also mentioned several times by the participants. So the second um, aspect of this um, integration process is highlighting the, the social inequalities between East and West Germany, and this is mainly a critical evaluation of the transformation process that took place after 1990. And the third aspect is pretty close to what Burkhard Olszewski has said, that um, ex participants elaborate um, on the different experiences of East and West Germans. Uh, on, on the one hand, the most life of most East Germans uh, obviously was more, more or less turned upside down after 89, while for a large proportion of West Germans, nothing, nothing really changed. In, in, and uh, we had one participant in a pretest from Bavaria who basically said, well, that was a local event and uh, we weren't really bothered. 
And all three aspects refer to issues of national identity, and I think that, or we think that this is why there are no uh, transnational references. Uh, with the exception of, uh, we have one single participant out of 25 in Germany who refers to the role of the solidarity movement. Um, what's interesting is two major differences between the official memory of 89 in Germany and our findings of our group discussions. The first one is that in official memory, the fall of the wall is a synonym for the fall of communism, which is characterized by state oppression uh, and the, secret, the role of the secret service Stasi. And the ever-rising number of refugees from the GDR during summer and autumn of 89 as inter is interpreted as a vote by the feet, as a longing of people for freedom and democracy. And this juxtaposition juxtaposition between democracy and dictatorship is not an issue at all in our group discussions. And the second um, difference is that in official memory there is an emphasis on the democratic opposition movement in the GDR and the, uh, 89 is even celebrated at the first successful and peaceful revolution in German history ever. Um, and it also I think still serves as a proof of the democratic character of Germany after 45. And this again is virtually absent in our group discussions. So to summarize, um, okay, no, that was, I'm sorry, I think there's one one missing, the conclusion, but I'm, I'm gonna give you orally. Uh, so what can we say about ordinary Europeans' views of 89? As, uh, as we've seen, uh, not so much, because in, in the UK and Spain, virtually it's not an issue at all. In, prom, in, in Poland, it is addressed when, when prompted by the moderator, and Germany is the only of the four countries where um, the actual events of 89 play a crucial role in the group discussions. And the, the framework in both Germany and Poland is, is pretty natural, uh, a national one, but there's a remarkable difference, I'd say. While German participants um, are national in the sense of self-sufficiency, uh, self largely ignoring that there is a world outside Germany, many Polish respondents perceive the outside world rather as a threat to what they perceive the, uh, as the historical truth. So you could say that the, the German perspective is a national one with a look inward, and the Polish one is a national perspective with a look outward. And you could discuss whether that is transnational or not. Um, and then as, as to the um, differences or, or in concordance with official memory uh, in, in Poland, as we've seen, the only difference is actually the, uh, the references to social security during communist times. And in, in Germany, I'd say it's the, the absence of the discourse about democracy and, and, the, and the opposition movement in 89. So as a final sentence, to go back to our first discussion, uh, the first question, if this action with the, with the posters by the Polish government did work, uh, we doubt it, but we cannot really say. I, as said, we have one of 25 German participants who re refer to the solidarity movement, but again, we have a methodological problem. We cannot tell if it's due to the poster or not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much also for keeping in time. And the last paper in this session of Aline Sierp, who is assistant professor in, professor in European Studies at Maastricht University, holds PhD in Comparative European Politics and History from Siena, and published recently this year the book History Memo and Trans-European Identity Unifying Divisions. And uh, she, before working at Maastricht University, she worked in uh, Dachau concentration camp memorial site, which might be somehow important in the context. And we will hear about European level of, of memory of 1989 and an attempt to cut the field in different way than east-west maybe, or right and left. Okay, well, thank you very much for this introduction. I have to admit, being the very last speakers in a three-day conference is a little bit of a daunting task. Um, I hope that you'll bear with me. Otherwise, it's, well, it's going to be over very soon, so don't worry. Um, what I noticed when I was listening to all the interventions in the last three days was one thing. 
Europe, the European Union is strangely absent from almost all of them. And the last intervention we just heard might give a little bit of a clue to this, which is the national framing of these events. Now, what I wanted to look at is um, what is happening on the European level. Um, and the main questions I asked when I started this research project were the following. So how is 1989 and the end of the Cold War remembered on the European level? Do we really only deal with the east-west divide um, that in some cases overlaps with the right-left divide? Then which role do the transnational party groups play? You probably know that, especially in the European Union, you have transnational party groups that are not organized according to, to nations, uh, to states. And do they put forward a collective or a collected framing of memories? Obviously, the whole question of what is collective, what is collective memory, etc., is a whole different discussion. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, but what I wanted to see is what kind of framework is being used here on the European level. Um, to say a few words about methodology, what I did is I analyzed all the debates, uh, reports and resolutions that were somehow connected to 1989 in the European Parliament using frame analysis. Now, why the European Parliament? Um, as you might know, the European Parliament on the European level is the main actor, uh, the main agent really of memory politics. You obviously also have uh, the European Commission and on the Council level you have the Justice and Home Affairs Council. Um, they are also de debating these issues. However, the European Parliament is, I think, the most interesting actor to look at in this context. Um, if you want to look at the whole picture, the complete picture, when you talk about the European Union, you obviously also have to look at these other actors. Now, for this presentation, I decided to concentrate on the European Parliament. To give you a little bit the wider context of European Union memory, because I think you have to understand the context if you want to talk about 1989 and uh, its memory, um, the EU, from at the very start of its existence, had, has always defined itself um, by reference to the backdrop of the experiences of war and dictatorship during World War II. This determination to avoid another war among European nations um, has become some kind of a master narrative, um, a master narrative of European integration, and you can also call it a founding myth, if you so want. Um, so if we talk about dates, are we talking about 1989, you could almost argue that 1945 is maybe even more important than 1950, which was the Schumann Declaration, or 1957, which was the Treaty of Rome. Since the 1990s, then, it's not only World War II, but it's a specific element of this, namely the Holocaust, that uh, became very important. It was of no significance for early European integration. Um, it was certainly not considered a point of reference, but then since the 1990s um, this became very important to define values, to define political goals in the European Union. And since the Stockholm Forum, International Forum in 2000, um, it was probably not only 1945 if we stay with the date frame, but particularly the 27th of January of 1945 that became important. Now, this predominance of the Holocaust um, has not been challenged since uh, the Eastern Enlargement 2004. Um, but this was the moment when a competing memory framework suddenly came to the fore, um, according to which the experience of suffering of Nazism and Stalinism are comparable and therefore should also receive equal recognition. And I think you're all familiar with the debates here. Um, I mention this because any discussion about 1989 has to be seen in this context. Now, when I was starting this research project, I tried to stay away from these memory struggles because this would be a different paper. You can talk a lot about these different frames, these competing memory narratives that suddenly came to the fore in the European level, particularly in the European Parliament. But what I wanted to look at is the question of how 1989 is being remembered and not necessarily what it's being remembered against. Um, I realized very quickly that it's almost impossible to look at one without the other. It's almost impossible to disentangle the two. Um, it is the background, the backdrop against which certain things are being defined. Um, now, the European Parliament in 1989, if we stay with the European Parliament as an actor, the Parliament has been extremely active in debating the events surrounding 1989. I've just finished a huge analysis that was commissioned by the European Parliament on these events. They wanted to know how this has been 
debated in the European Parliament, and I analyzed over 800 documents to just give you the sheer volume of the discussions that have been taking place, obviously in the four years around 89, but then also afterwards in the run-up to accession, and also before um, 1988. Um, the European Parliament has usually tried to present itself as some kind of an avant-garde. Um, it's always stressing that it has foreseen the events um, that were going to take place. Um, it knew much uh, earlier than the Council or the Commission what was going to happen. Um, it knew what, what it had to do, etc., etc. This is obviously closely connected to its role huh? within the institutional structure, just trying to assert its role. Um, it didn't have any de decision power at the time, um, but it was trying to put itself, to pitch itself against the European Commission and the European Council. Nevertheless, you can clearly see it was also, also overtaken by the event. Huh? We heard yesterday people mentioning the fact that they had not foreseen the fall of the, world, uh, of the Berlin Wall, and that was certainly the case in the Parliament as well. It nevertheless tries to present itself as a beacon of democracy and human rights. Um, economic considerations played a surprising little role. I was very surprised to see that, actually. Um, and then only in connection with the question of political stabilization and advantages for Western markets. However, what um, Anna was mentioning before, the loss of the welfare model did play a role on the European level as well. Um, and there maybe it was going or it was closer to, to the um, view of citizens um, when particularly the, the left um, groups were saying, well, maybe we're going to lose something here in Europe if we are trying to push a Western system on the Eastern states. Controversial discussions were mainly about the German unification and about the right to self-determination. And this in context with the Baltic states and Yugoslavia mainly. And this is where you find a clear right-left division. Now, again, I mentioned this because it's a backdrop to what I'm going to tell you now. This right-left division, I somehow thought I would find out again when we were discussing 1989, because this was the most obvious uh, to, to um, hypothesis. Now, commemoration of 1989. You probably know that there's no official commemoration of 1989 on the European level that is labeled as such. That's the important thing. Obviously, there's commemorations of 1989, but it's not labeled as the commemoration of 1989. It always appears when World War II is commemorated. It usually appears when there's discussions about human rights, about accession, obviously. Um, it is usually framed as the moment when the double burden of totalitarianism has been lifted from Europe. Obviously, there's formal sittings. That's different from official commemorations, though. Formal sittings of the European Parliament, where the presidents of the Central and Eastern European countries are being invited, where they give speeches. Um, the most prominent was probably um, at the 20th anniversary in um, November 2009, and then in 2010, in October, when um, the, it was the 10th of the 20th anniversary of the German unification. These debates are not very interesting. Uh, I read them all. Um, I was very disappointed, uh, to be honest, because I didn't see, maybe not so surprisingly, but I didn't see any debates involving there. It was all very, yeah, very uniform, uh, almost coded. Um, what you would call in German Sonntagsreden, Sunday speeches, um, no debate there, really. Um, probably also due to the fact that um, they are heavily dominated by external speakers. Now, obviously, now I could say, um, well, that was the end of my research project. Didn't find very much. Um, then I thought, okay, well, let's let's see where do we actually find discussions happening on the European level. And um, the the most obvious to look at is obviously the the attempt to establish a Remembrance Day for the victims of all totalitarian regimes on the 23rd of August. Um, this Day of Remembrance was proclaimed with a declaration on the 23rd of September 2008 and was implemented then by a European Parliament resolution on European Conscience and Totalitarianisms. That's, that's the official title of it. And this is being observed by the European institutions in different ways. So there's usually an address, address by the European President or the Vice President of the Commission you do not necessarily have necess uh, uh, parliamentary debates, um, but it's certainly something that is being observed by the institutions. Now, to zoom in a little bit on this resolution, there were two main debates that are very interesting to look at. Um, 
The European Council asked the Commission to organize a European Parliament hearing on the 8th of April 2008. Um, and this was basically after the requests by the Lithuanian representatives fell through to include the denial of communist crimes in the 2007 framework decision on combating, combating racism and xenophobia. So this hearing was some kind of a compromise. Since this fell through, they said, okay, well, let's at least have a hearing, a public hearing on this. This was followed by a second hearing in 2009 that was organized by the Czech presidency. Um, um, we're basically, yeah, they, they, they organized this hearing on the European conscious and the crimes of totalitarian communism 20 years after. So it fell together with the 20th anniversary. In the run up of these hearings, um, the socialists, the transnational group of, of socialists, they created a working group, a working group on history. And they did that because they wanted to invite the EU to act against any attempt to rewrite history. This was their main concern. If you look at the debates, they're extremely heated. Um, they're cutting across existing lines of division, which usually lung around national, so newcomers against old states, um, older member states, as well as ideological lines, right wing versus left wing. Um, generally speaking, you had two groups, the conservatives that were backed up by the liberals and by the greens, and that were opposing the socialists. The far left refused to join the debate. They did not participate, they did not table any motions for resolutions, they just stayed away from this. However, if you look more closely at the political groups, it was not so clear cut. You had divisions within the political groups, particularly in the left, and they often had to do with the way communism was interpreted, um, or the nature of communism was interpreted. Um, but also within the national delegations, if you try to split, look at them more in detail, you could see that there were clear divisions within them. So to give one example, the Greek conservatives who are organized in the European People's Party, um, the conservatives were following a certain line, but the, the, the Greeks were very much against equalizing communism and, uh, and Nazism, and this was obviously for historical reasons, for the role that the communists had played during the Civil War. So you had these historical contexts that were very important and were suddenly playing a much more important role than ideological belonging of the different MEPs. And you can these, see these differences very clearly if you look at the motions that were tabled by the four different groups, um, where the socialists adopted a very different stance compared to the European People's Party, compared to the Greens, the Liberals. Um, um, they tried, because there were four different motions, obviously if you want to have a resolution you have to find some kind of a compromise. Um, so they were trying to, to come up with a joint motion. Um, and uh, that was tabled by the, um, again, by, by the conservatives, by the Greens and by, by the liberals, but it was um, the, um, the socialists refused to join this motion which was quite a good move, mood, be, uh, move because basically what happened is that they were in a very good position to negotiate then. So when this motion was on the table, um, they uh, just said, okay, we're going to refuse to, to join it, but we won't have some amendments. And that's basically what happened. And uh, they were able to impose almost all of the amendments during the plenary session that took place on the 2nd of April. Now this final resolution was then adopted on the 2nd of April of 2009 with an overwhelming majority. 554 against 45 uh, votes, 33 abstentions. Um, if we go a little bit more deeper in the text, then we can see um, where the influence of the socialists was. So they started, or it starts if you read it, with a clear warning against any political instrumentalization of history. Um, it also includes the southern European dictatorships, and I thought it was very interesting to hear earlier on that in Spain, for example, 1989 does not play a role with a, among ordinary Europeans. And the, on the European level, it did play a very important role for two reasons. Already before uh, 1989 and before accession, obviously, of the Central and Eastern European states, because it had to do with redistribution money that was channeled, channeled usually to the southern European states, um, they were suddenly afraid, particularly Spain, but also Greece um, and Italy, that this money would then go to Central and Eastern Europe. Um, in the context of the resolution, 
uh, it was not so much about redistribution, it was about um, the legacy of different historical totalitarian uh, experiences. So what about um, the fascist experience of uh, Greece, of Spain, of Portugal, for example. And these um, experiences are included in the resolution as well. So it's not only about communism, um, about, uh, about Nazism, but it's also about the Southern European dictatorships. That's why you have this very wide title as well. It also distinguished clearly Stalinism from communism. So it's not talking about communism and Nazism, it's clearly talking about Stalinism and Nazism. And it mentions the uniqueness of the Holocaust. That was another very um, important point of debate. Um, what role does the Holocaust play in this? Is it a unique experience or do we have to put it together with all other experiences of totalitarian regimes? Um, now, this resolution had a very little impact. There were no legal consequences. So um, the uh, conservatives, liberals and greens had clearly called for the establishment of a court, an international court. Um, they wanted to have a denial of communist crimes being penalized. Um, this did not happen. Um, what did happen was that the 23rd of August was established um, as a Remembrance Day, but you're probably aware of the fact that um, it failed completely to gain the same, ki same kind of symbolic importance that the 27th of January has. Um, I always play this trick with my students. I ask, I ask what the 27th of January means, um, what it is, and um, I will, well, I'm, if I'm lucky, 50% know about this, which I think is terrible. Um, if you talk about the 23rd of August, uh, it's even worse. It's maybe 10% know what the 23rd of August means in the European context. If you look at... Um, the, the impact on the European level, however, the Commission's priorities for funding this year are clearly targeting this. So um, they, they prioritize the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the 10th anniversary of the arrival of Central and Eastern European countries in the Baltic States as EU members. So on the European level, at least, this is, this is very prominent. Now, what does all of this tell us? Um, obviously, if you move beyond the empirical level and ask what's actually below, if you scratch a bit, bit deeper, um, below, I think, is, is a much deeper question. Um, and that is the question, if we can, can have some kind of a single legitimate regime of remembrance in Europe. And if you talk about the institutional level, should the European Parliament or the EU as a whole promote one vision or multiple perspectives on historical events? And I think this was the question that was underlying this whole conference as well. It's the collective versus collector, collected memories. Um, the problem, uh, this is certainly a problem that the EU has tried to deal with. Um, it, it has been trying to deal with that also in the context of World War II. Um, if we analyze all the initiatives, particularly of the Commission and um, the vision that they have, um, they're certainly pushing for some kind of a multi-perspectivity. However, at least in the European Parliament, you also have these informal groups um, that are trying to force a collective vision of history. You, for example, to give one example, um, you have the Reconciliation of European Histories Group, that's their name, and they are trying to establish some kind of a single historical truth at the European level. Well, the question is if, if we can have something like this. Um, this is a question I cannot answer, obviously. Um, but it's certainly a question that's going to occupy not only us, but also the European Union in the next decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. And now I ask you for possibly brief summaries, comments. Okay, so these are three fascinating uh, papers from highly ambitious projects. Um, they juxtapose levels of European official, national official, and vernacular memory, mix them up together, play around with them.
they're all very ambitious, either in terms of making comparisons that are not often made uh, directly between countries from the East and West to show them into sharp relief with each other, uh, in terms of, of uh, exhaustive collection of data um, or doing uh, a combination of secondary level, uh, secondary level research and uh, in-depth kind of uh, focus group research in combination with each other. So these are all very impressive projects. Um, that said, I'll make a few comments which um, will point out perhaps issues which I think could have been taken further or, um, or that I think are still somewhat unresolved and my purpose in doing this is completely constructive to help move the projects along and not to be uh, a critical crank. Um, I'll start with Burkhardt's paper. Um, it's very interesting. On one level, we talk about the round table as a foundational myth, but yet at the same time, it's the most hotly contested, uh, one of the most hotly contested parts of Polish political culture. And that's clearly with intention throughout your paper. One thing that I think you could, you could add to the mix is talking about, you know, the so-called, you talk about the commemoration of 1999. But if you, if you do a Google search for the 10th anniversary of the round table, you'll find nothing, but there was something very interesting that took place, which I would tell you you should take a look at. Imagine a stage that was shared by Buyak, Kshanovsky, and Chosek, or Lech Kaczynski, Alexander Kwasniewski, and Archbishop Aloji Orshulek, or where Mieczysław Rakowski, Jan Lutynski, and Alexander Hall shared the stage. The only thing is that it didn't happen in Poland. It happened in Ann Arbor, Michigan from the 7th to 10th of, of April in 1999. It wasn't possible in Poland. It had to be held in Ann Arbor. And there's, there's extensive transcripts of what went on at that conference on the web. And I would tell you maybe to get a look into it. And I think if you brought that into your analysis, it would allow you to juxtapose it beautifully with what you do for 2009 and 2014. Oh, uh, let's see. Your analysis of 2009 I found very interesting. You picked up a point, I think, which Jan and I in our analysis didn't make strongly enough, which was that the June elections in some sense did not have to fully incorporate um, the SLDA into it. But I would point, so it was more of a, of, of a solidarity celebration, but I would point out two things about that. One, Kwasniewski did participate in the, the events in Warsaw, the commemorative meetings at the same. So he was brought in, and the, the post-communists were not in the least bit critical of the elections publicly. That is, they treated them as a normal thing and part of the reform process, so they didn't attack them. In 2009, the roundtable split, which, which existed earlier, carried over into the, uh, s the, the celebration of the vote. And literally, peace and, um, and platforma celebrated separately, with peace having its own separate uh, celebration in Gdańsk with the trade unions, and, and platforma celebrating over two days in Warsaw and in Gdańsk, and that, that being the one that brought in all the international guests and finally brought Lech Wałęsa into the celebrations. So uh, there's, there's a slightly more complex story there, which I think you should get in. Both papers which compared the GDR and Poland had this very fascinating angle in them for me, which is the complete bearing, almost complete bearing of the resistance tradition in the German Democratic Republic. Uh, so sort of, and for me, in, in both cases, the, the great irony of this is that the only actor to play a role in some sense from the former German Republic, uh, from the former German Democratic Republic, is, is the elements of Die Linke, which come from the SED. So in some sense, the opposition has been written out of the history, but there is some remnant of the SED still playing a role in German politics, and that's a, that I find to be a sad irony. Um, I think both papers also that compare Poland and the GDR point out some very interesting stuff. 
uh, which may talk about a kind of breakdown of the, of the national consensus that Germany has about, um, about the fall of the wall, that there do seem to be some alternative celebrations, such as the one in Burkhardt's paper uh, about Leipzig. And I think that's pretty interesting, that that's actually, that subnationally, people in the former GDR are beginning to, to think about the legacy of the opposition. And I think in terms of um, differences between East and West, that's a very interesting proposition because it kind of repowers people in the East to think about their own freedom rather than seeing it as only a unification narrative and bringing people into the framework of the Bundesrepublik. Um, the other thing that I think is pretty interesting in Burkhardt's paper is the, the, the discussion around Bogdan uh, Zdrojewski, who talks about the poll, lamenting that the Poles aren't seen as being responsible for 1989 anymore. And I think to some extent, um, and I hesitate to say this in this room, but the Poles to a certain extent are responsible for that because of their division over the round table. That is, they have in some sense squandered their legacy by squabbling with each other for domestic political reasons. This is something Jan and I have talked a lot about. Um, and then the other th there's another thing I, I, I want to point out, which I think is interesting and might be something we could talk about more broadly in the, the discussion, um, which are the differences between 2009 and 2014 in terms of, uh, in terms of celebration. So in Poland, 2014 was far less contentious than the events that Jan and I described. And I think there are three possible explanations for this. One could be what was happening in the Ukraine. I think of earlier research I did sort of on disputes between the Polish left and right, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the writing of the Polish constitution uh, in the interwar period. And what was truly amazing was how accommodating both sides were to each other until the borders were settled and the Treaty of Versailles was signed. And at that point, they started getting very contentious with each other and fighting to, uh, to, to manipulate the Constitution in, the, in a way that would, would privilege certain kinds of actors. And I think maybe Ukraine could have had a, a uh, what was going on in Ukraine might have had a depressive effect on that. I think a second possible explanation could lie with um, with simply Obama being here and that forcing people to be on good behavior as well. Um, the third reason I think also could be the failure of the maneuvers that Peace tried in 2009. That is, it was, as, as Jan and I called it, it was a very sharp mem memory warrior, but in terms of what happened in terms of the next set of elections, in terms of the election of the president and the elections to the same, it was a disaster for Peace. So maybe they decided to try a new strategy. But it would be interesting, I think, to discuss that. Um, good. Um, oh, and this, this actually ap applies to the, the, the discussion in Anna and Lars's paper as well. So I'll carry this kind of discussion over into that. I'm also thinking of the celebration of Germany in 2009 and whether the high noon poster worked. Um, and indeed, nobody from Eastern Europe was, was given a keynote speech, but in terms of the symbolic events and the toppling of the dominoes, Valenza was one of the topplers of the dominoes, and of course the first domino was in Poland. So in 2009, Poland symbolically was given a major role at the wall, and I think that's important to remember. The thing that I think is very interesting when you contrast it with 2014 is, um, is that Gorbachev is the guest of honor this year, which is remarkably different, and we might want to think about whether that's symbolic or not and what that potentially means. Um, now to, to Anna and Lars' paper in more detail. Um, on the individual level, it's amazingly how much less consciousness than there is of the importance of these events at the official level. It's, um, it's, it's really amazing the kinds of events in the UK and Spain, and, but also how narrowly focused and national Poland and Germany are rather than having a transnational kind of level. One thing I wondered about in terms of your research design was the ages of your focus groups, which it was people from 25 to 40. 
And, you know, a 40-year-old would be 15 in 1989, and a 25-year-old would just be being born. So I'm, I wondered if you had older people in the focus groups, whether the dynamics would have been different, people who were more adult when the events went on. That being said, I, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but I wonder how the results would have been different. And I think then it, what's really interesting in the results, you, if we assume that they would be somewhat different if there were older people there, it means that the experience that these people sort of directly experienced somehow is not being transmitted. And that's an interesting paradox, and it strikes me that that's a really interesting project for follow-on when you get done with the first stage. So if you have these younger people who are not, or who are not getting a transmitted, um, a, a transmitted set of collected memories from, from the older folks, why is that going on? That strikes me as a fascinating question. Um, it also struck me that on the popular level, or what you call the vernacular level, the picture of the round table doesn't seem as divided as it does on the official level. Um, that there doesn't seem to be sharp contention within your groups in the same way there is in the official political sphere. And that's interesting because that talks about what was going on in the official, in the official memory sphere is something that was political and manipulated and, and more divisive than the actual state of affairs in the population. So I found that to be a kind of fascinating result. Um, with, your German, with your German sample, you say in the paper that, it's, um, that it was very Berlin-centered, and obviously if you're at the Freie Universität, it's much easier to conduct your focus groups around Berlin. But I wonder, I wonder how it would have been different if you had done focus groups as well in places like Gerlitz or Rostock or Koblenz or Reutlingen, much more sort of... Um, Berlin is a special place, so I wonder if it would have been different in those other places and whether you have thoughts about that. And of course, would it have been different if you'd done it in Leipzig as well? Would there have been other things? Um, I was also fascinated with the German stuff on the, on the loss of memory of the struggle for freedom uh, again. Not only the Monday demonstrations seem to have disappeared, but uh, for me, so I remember watching that at the time and when the Negotiations came over extracting the people who were in the embassy compound in Prague. The GDR leadership made this horrible mistake of forcing them to come back to the GDR, and then there was the train ride through the GDR where they could then go to the, to the Bundesrepublik. And to me, that was maybe the biggest mistake they made. I remember seeing these pictures of, as this train was pulling through stations, of large numbers of people coming out and demonstrating, and that often seemed to me to be the moment that broke the back of the regime. And there doesn't seem to be any recollection of that as well. Um, okay. And finally, Aline's, Alina's paper. Um, I'm really struck at these, these kinds of differences in these flexible camps. And when I read history as a social scientist, I'm, almost, I'm always struck by irony. And these are the, the kinds of, and, and somehow I think irony helps us to um, highlight key issues and tensions. And this, this sort of leads me to wonder if there can ever be a European consensus on this. Is there a compromise possible? Or are these issues which have domestic roots on which parties even if they're sitting in, 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 an e, in the European Parliament, can't compromise on because of domestic audiences. So I, one of the great ironies here, I think, is the irony of communist resistance. The, the only countries where there's strong defense of communist resistance is the second war, in the Second World War are those countries where it does not win the post-war power struggle. So one could not imagine, for instance, a celebration of the Armia Ludowa in Poland. That is, that is, is without a doubt um, something that you could, that you, that's very hard to imagine. Yet at the same time, one can think about the communist resistance being celebrated in Italy, Greece, or France. And I point out in all those three countries, too, those were some of the strongest components, if not the strongest component of the resistance 
to Nazism. The other place where I see the irony is in countries in particular where there was um, either allied cooperation or when I say allied co cooperation as allies or collaboration with the Axis. So where there were countries that were allied with the Axis during the Second World War or countries where there were strong movements of collaboration. And this is where I see the real tension. So when does the, who is a victim of, Stal, of Stalinism and who is a Nazi collaborator? You know, this comes out very strongly with the whole debate over Bandera in the, in the Ukraine and the way that's perceived differently within Ukraine and without. Uh, we see this with the veterans of the Waffen-SS in the Baltic states, some of whom were volunteers and some of whom were not. Uh, you know, perhaps we can treat those who volunteered and those who were drafted differently, but these are, these are tensions that are not easily resolvable, I think. Um, you know, so, so is someone who, um, are, the Hungarians have also kind of tried to split the difference. So the, the Horthy regime is seen as, as, a, as an exemplar of Hungarian nationhood and one that was, re that was rejecting Bolshevism. Yet at the same time, the Orban regime has taken the arrow cross and said they were beyond the pale and they were, they were, um, they were perpetrators just as bad as the Stalinists. So there's these very tense moral issues and a whole set of lines that haven't been effectively drawn, which I think, despite the amount of work you've done and kind of, I mean, the amount of work you did of just sort of reading everything that read this in the EU, I wonder, I, I just wonder, despite that, whether any kind of resolution is ever possible on these issues or whether this will fester until it fades into the background and is no longer a salient issue. So those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for these comments. I will not, not let you answer now, otherwise we have no chance for discussion. Please keep these questions in mind, reduce your answers to very short. And, uh, and I would now open discussion, collect three, four questions, and then together with comments and remarks from Michael, we, I will let you answer them. And so please ask questions. Okay, the short question about this. Uh, indicators of education and international experiences. Uh, did they really uh, make any distinctions in your, uh, in, the, in the answers? So whether high educated with international experience really uh, knew more about the 1989? And also the question about this, uh, uh, this continuity of answers, because I understand that people didn't know 1989 but then they uh, pointed out that 1989 was important in the uh, 20th century memory of the Europe, yes? To, uh, am I correct? That, that uh, people asked directly about the 1989, that they did not know what's going on, but then they pointed out that 1989 was an important factor. Did I understand? Yeah, so the question is, uh, what, what, what is the reason whether they, they the, the, the line of the questions just, just suggested people that they should just put 1989 in this uh, shadow. If you ask about 1989, they understood, oh, it's really important, so we should put it back to, the, uh, to this idea of the events of the 20th century. Adam Miltarek. Uh, I would like to uh, make a short comment on uh, Burkhard Olszewski's speech. Uh, and that's a problem of understanding of the discourse of the uh, so-called solidarity right. Uh, I mean this uh, anti-roundtable discourse. 
I think that you don't make a sufficient effort to understand it. And uh, <coughs> in the result, uh, you uh, reproduce uh, the frames of uh, uh, solidarity left, which is uh, the political correctness uh, uh, frames. And uh, it's clearly visible. I think that uh, uh, you don't make an effort to uh, balance uh, your speech. Uh, I can give two examples. The first is a sentence that uh, the, this conflict is a product of uh, political conflict and the party discourse. It is not true. Uh, the party discourse is a reflection of uh, social processes and uh, of uh, the cleavage in uh, Polish solidarity movement that uh, took uh, place uh, after 89. The second is a sentence I, I've noted that uh, uh, round table uh, is a victory uh, that was uh, achieved uh, uh, around the negotiation table, not on the barricades. That is uh, <coughs> a clear example of very partisan interpretation. Uh, the conflict about between left and Polish left, solidarity left and right, uh, is the conflict of values. And, it is a con and uh, the essence of this conflict is in your sentence. If uh, the promoters of uh, round table say that uh, that was a victory uh, achieved uh, <coughs> during the speech uh, around the round table, not on the barricades, the solidarity right would say that what is important, that are uh, those people that were on the barricades and they were much more important than the negotiation that were the result of this struggle. So uh, this is uh, uh, the point. These are these uh, different values that are promoted uh, by the, by the, by the uh, different sides of the conflict. The first is the elites that are negotiating and that in your the struggle that was before them. And the second is, uh, is a democratic movement that wants, in the situation that we can, wants to ignore those elites uh, that uh, sat around the round table. I can continue, but uh, I think it's enough. Professor Putkamer is on my list. Thank you. <coughs> uh, general question, uh, and maybe mostly to the political scientist, what is wrong with contested memories? Um, <coughs> I have the um, <coughs> impression that uh, what we're doing here is um, when we're looking at the way um, um, we have these celebrations, um, these celebrations are about um, reasserting the foundations of the present day political democratic systems. Um <coughs> and this reassertion and renegotiation, um, um, if it goes in a controversial way, first of all, shows uh, that democracy is alive. Um, <coughs> but um, <coughs> if it doesn't go, on the one hand, uh, into enemy camps, so one wouldn't have to look at uh, people addressing each other as if they were standing in enemy camps and not finding any common ground even for the discussion. Um <coughs> but on the other hand, what we don't want either is um, sort of a mythical unity, um, all sort of having the same um, basic idea of what the national or political community uh, is all about, um, as we tend to see it in Russia at the moment, and no debate possible uh, on these foundations. <coughs> and um, <coughs> so I would first of all uh, say, um, as, as long as there is a contestation and, and a vivid debate um, <coughs> on these foundations, it's a good sign. Um <coughs> but that also goes to, to the second question, which uh, Aram Yacharek also in a way addressed, um, on whether we are speaking about memory or whether we are speaking about values. Uh, James Verge said in his, uh, <coughs> at the beginning of this conference that mnemonic uh, communities are not, do not, cannot be explained by reference to values. Uh, and I'm not quite sure whether what you've been discussing here actually supports um, this assertion or not. Thank you.
much. Maybe now answering this round, who starts? Yeah, maybe I'll start by answering the, the questions concerning the, the design and the uh, sample of the study. So as for the age, uh, our main uh, target was not memories of 89 in the first place. So actually we chose this cohort uh, because we thought it's people that uh, kind of have been affected uh, by EU. Uh, so there's at least a chance of uh, transnational ways of thinking as our main focus was the relationship between national and transnational frameworks of memory. Um, as for the places, we would have loved to, to do many more groups in many more cities, of course, but I think the focus in Berlin rather uh, symbolizes the, the narrow focus. Uh, as I've mentioned, we also have a very narrow focus in the sense of uh, family memories, so we don't even reach the national scale, and I think the re references to the city of Berlin are just another symbol for that. Um, as for the differences in education and transnational experience, um, there's not so many in, in um, regarding transnational experiences, which might be uh, might have to do with how we operate, operationalize that. Um, but there are clear differences in terms of education in some countries. And here I have to refer to uh, James Forge's notion of the narrative templates. And in some countries, we just have the same template uh, in all four groups. And in Germany, for example, is the case where we have two completely different narrative templates between the higher and lower educated people. And, um, and roughly, the higher educated are much closer to official discourse than the lower educated. And, but it has all to do with the memory of the national socialism and not 89. So. Um, and, and about the different questions. So in the beginning, we did a very open question about any events, and here Germany was the only country where 89 played a role. We would then later ask about events from the other, sea, uh, other three countries, and then in the last third, we would ask about potentials of European memory. And, and this is in the second, uh, two second thirds, where 89 played a role in Poland and the other two countries, but not to, to that extent that it did in Germany. So. Oh, yeah. maybe. Uh, maybe regarding 1989, uh, we had some differences uh, in Poland um, among the higher educated and the less educated. Uh, this was uh, referring to social welfare and the lack of social welfare. This was uh, much more uh, stated by less educated people and uh, the higher educated people were were the ones uh, who uh, stressed the democratic achievements in terms of human rights. Um, yeah, but this is no surprise, I would say. And, um, uh, and in, in Spain, for instance, uh, what Lars just told us about Germany and these totally uh, different templates, um, uh, this doesn't play such a big role, for example, like in Germany. So we have differences, uh, not only in terms of, of education, but also in national terms, um, crossing each other. Yeah, there were a couple of questions. Uh, first, a uh, uh, short reference then to, to Michael, that you, you uh, noticed uh, different things and asked already. Uh, also, thanks. Um, yeah, concerning to 1999, you're right. Uh, there was indeed saying this conference in, in Aber, and uh, at that time I was actually doing research at the Hoover Institution in uh, Palo Alto, and I was uh, somehow genius or yeah, that I couldn't get saying to an Aber at that time, and I noticed this. Uh, I brought it up in the paper, but um, I'm. I'm simply not sure if it would be, would at that time, impossible to bring them on the table. Maybe, or there was no organization who tried to do this. And, and all of them, indeed, they traveled then to an ABRA, which is a center for Slavonic studies in the US, by the way. And, and then you notice also these kind of jealousness or sometimes even a bit of accusation that because of the fact that in Germany the Gorbachev was highlighted, the fleeing movement over Hungary, and uh, that the, the Polish contribution was 
Dynamisch. Indeed, it was uh, dynamisch. That's why these campaigns are Cherosha Polska it began in Poland. And um, yeah, Mr. Drewski uh, said then, unfortunately, Poland was constantly displaced or permanently displaced uh, in the interpretation of 1989, which is a bit overstated in my opinion. Um, the Ukrainian, it's uh, also a good point. With Barack Obama, it's um, at, at the one hand, the Poles were very pleased that they unexpectedly could welcome Barack Obama on the 4th of June, and, but in fact, they expected more, not just warm words. They wanted to have troops and a significant number of permanent stationed US troops, so it's, it's also an ambivalence. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, there, there was another point to, to the post-communists, but maybe later on can speak about it. And what uh, Adam Yucharek uh, said, well, um, I um, brought in, in my paper, I had to look then the origins of these quarrels, and I said, well, there was the diversity of personal memories on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, there was indeed, uh, there was, um, the creation of meaning among sections of political parties and their influence on the social and media sphere. And um, I'm still thinking uh, that if you see both, um, the, the, the personal, uh, or the diversity of personal memories and the public factor. And uh, another thing is, you mentioned it, that there is this division between right and left. I mean, that's another. That's, that, yeah, well, that's another point. How do you define it? Twenty-five years afterwards, right and left. I mean, it's. I, I would do this in, in, in an academic paper uh, to say right or left uh, solidarity member or former solidarity member, and uh, it's at least in, in my opinion, very hard to find it in such a category. Um, but you are right with a social process on and, and the conflict about values. I mentioned not the, the barricade issue. I mean, that's certainly it's a reference to, um, to the Warsaw upheaval um, to, say, to say that it was like a different approach. I don't want to overstate this argument. Another argument is um, concerning values. Uh, that's indeed how, uh, how far Poland want to turn westwards, including so-called Western values like um, etization on liberal market and other uh, like gender issues, which are in Poland right now, a very uh, hot debate. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> Hania said me it's enough, uh, but if you're speaking about values, that's getting uh, uh, endless, yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll be very brief. Um, what's wrong with contested memories? Obviously, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm actually quite glad they're there, otherwise I wouldn't have anything to analyze. Um, <laughs> I totally agree, though, that these tensions that we were talking about earlier are very difficult to resolve. Um, and that's where the second point you made comes in. Do we talk about memories? Do we talk about values? Um, if we talk about memories, I think we will always have this problem of having very different memories that are almost impossible to put under one framework. Um, we had the problem with the Second World War. We will have the problem with 1989. I think this is, this is an open uh, conflict that is probably never going to be solved unless we move it to another level. If we move away from the actual historical experience and we start talking about values, then I think we can find some kind of common ground. Um, and that's exactly what the European Union is trying to do. Uh, it's often been accused of trying to find some kind of a common denominator, um, which is probably the smallest one, um, and uh, without really respecting the historical differences in between countries. But that, that's not really the aim. The aim is to find a common ground that is based on common values. Um, and that's, I think, when we can start talking about some kind of a European memory if we move away from the historical experiences. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, can't 
Representation of memories can be very different whether, whether the memory regime, to go back to what Jan and I did in our framework, is fractionalized or pillarized. And the difference between the two in terms of what that means for a kind of um, a sense of community and a sense of, of, of um, a sense of community despite contested memories uh, is, I think, really significant. Two, three last questions, if there are any. <laughs> no, there are no, so mm, let's have a break and we see each other in 30 minutes. <laughs>